is Balaji Ganesh, and I work with Wipro Technologies. So let me welcome you to this uh, session on Lean for Competitive Advantage and Customer Delight. So uh, without much ado, let me just uh, get into the uh, topic. So the reason why Competitive Advantage and Customer Delight words are uh, used here, let me just try to illustrate that. Uh, statistics or data shows that only 40% of the projects meet uh, schedule, budget, and uh, quality goals, and 50% of the projects uh, do not give any uh, return on investment. So considering this kind of a scenario, uh, what we do in terms of uh, meeting the schedule or budget or quality goal and looking at how you can optimize the cost can itself create a competitive advantage or a differentiator in the marketplace. So that is one of the reasons why I use the word uh, competitive advantage. And uh, getting a little bit uh, into customer delight, uh, I do remember uh, reading a book a uh, couple of years back uh, by uh, Sam Walton, who was the uh, founder of Walmart. He said, uh, he made a statement like, the uh, customer pays your salary, and he can fire you any day. So we are all here because of the customer and because of what we do for the customer. So lean uh, being a process which has uh, maximization of customer value as its focus, it's probably one of the things which can help to reach there you know, in terms of making your customer successful as well as making yourself uh, successful in the process. So with that uh, introduction, let me get into the uh, agenda. So uh, today I, I will be sharing an experience report of one of the projects, application development projects. So this is not an application development project in the strict sense that it was not a development from scratch. Rather, we were looking at an add-on development to an existing code base. So I will be getting into the project context in terms of the challenges and the background. And I'll be moving on to uh, uh, you know, uh, describe the lean uh, tenets and techniques that we have used in this uh, particular project. I'll be moving on to, I'll be talking about uh, four lean tenets and techniques, namely visual controls, mistake proofing, design structure matrix, and orthogonal arrays. So uh, how did we tie up these uh, four things together so that we were able to meet the project goals in a better way? And I'll be moving on to the benefits, whatever we had achieved, uh, and of course the uh, conclusion and the closing thoughts. So with respect to the project, this was, uh, a team size of 40. So this was an uh, add-on development project as I described uh, earlier. It was in the insurance domain. Uh, <coughs> the uh, functionality was planned for uh, rollout to five states spanning two different uh, iterations. And uh, the scope was a complete scope, you know, right from requirements gathering to user acceptance testing and warranty support. So the approach that we used here was, uh, you know, before we started really getting into why we applied the tenets uh, you know, that we applied. We did a brainstorming, identified the challenges, then we started doing a mapping to the relevant tools and techniques. And of course, nothing works without a plan of action and also having some owners to get the uh, accountability right. So we had uh, identified owners based on the actions that we identified, then we executed the plan. And of course, we followed the classic dictum of plan, do, check, and act. So were these tools and techniques really helping us to achieve what we wanted to achieve? So with that, uh, let me move on to the uh, challenge. So uh, I have just tried to categorize uh, the multiple challenges, whatever we faced in a quadrant. And the reason why I put uh, quality and people together is because I wanted to make it a quadrant, not because of anything else. And also because of the reason that you know people do have an impact on the quality of the deliverables. So let me get a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit of a deep dive into what were the challenges from the quality and the people perspective. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, see this was a ongoing project and we had the previous releases uh, where the customer did not have exactly a good experience you know, from the quality perspective. So there was a lot of slippage that was happening to the system testing and the user acceptance testing phases. And what I mean by in-process defects here is right from requirements till unit testing, also there were a lot of defects which probably meant that you know, I was finding more defects in the process and also having a lot of defects in the page which is getting into my system testing and user acceptance testing phase, meaning that quality at source is bad. So we need to do something about it. And the team uh, for this particular release was doing the requirements gathering and the business analysis for the first time. And with respect to the team, you know, we had a typical challenge which is uh, faced in any service company. 
So we had a lot of uh, churn in the team from the previous release and also certain rotations that had happened. So we had two sets of people, people who were fresh and were doing development for the first time and also people you know, who were into the team for the first time and had to get familiarized with the processes. And of course the team and the customer collaboration was not exactly something to be proud of, so we wanted to do something about it as well. From a technical perspective, uh, there was a lot of you know, code reuse which was to be done from the previous uh, releases, so that was one of the challenges. And of course, change management. You have a large code base, and you know, it is more like you, know, you have a stack of cards you know, which is stacked as a pyramid, and if you're adding one or two cards, and if you're not careful, you will uh, probably encounter the risk of uh, collapsing the entire uh, pyramid. So we had uh, such a kind of a situation here. So we had to prioritize the feature sets. We wanted to, uh, this uh, project was uh, done using a waterfall model earlier. So the change here was moving from waterfall to iterative uh, mode of development. So what needs to go into each of these uh, iterations is uh, you know, what we wanted to prioritize. And there was a high degree of dependencies between the modules that was getting uh, impacted as part of the project. Looking at the contractual obligations, the customer, because of the lack of confidence from the previous releases, had set certain stringent uh, parameters. So we had to deliver with zero critical and high defects and less than 10 medium and low defect. And the customer satisfaction was at its uh, lowest ebb. So this was a more of a risk reward model where there were certain penalties uh, you know, which had to be paid uh, if it did not meet the uh, quality and the schedule criteria. From a scope and schedule perspective, the pressure on the schedule came from two things. One was uh, regression testing for the states which were already in production, which we had to do. And uh, because of the poor upstream quality in the previous releases, there was a last minute scramble and people started creating more and more errors you know, because of the time pressure and because of the way the change was managed you know, towards the end. And the customer also had an expectation that certain percentage of change requests had to be absorbed within the schedule, which was a new requirement. So moving on, uh, I'll be talking about mistake proofing, which is more about uh, deducting and preventing uh, defects at the source, and about visual controls, design structure matrix, competency management more from the perspective of how we can allot the work as per the competency, how do we develop the competency, and you know, uh, you know, uh, taking a structured approach towards that, and seeing how it works in tandem with uh, mistake proofing or a vi visual control you know, kind of a thing. And orthogonal arrays, of course, from optimization as well as a, you know, a design perspective as well. So we'll uh, probably look more into these as we go along. Uh, the term I used, uh, sharpen the axe, uh, as we all know, you know, there is a saying that if I had eight hours to do work, I'd spend six hours sharpening the axe. So most of these techniques that we talk about are techniques to sharpen the axe so that they can do a better job in terms of quality and in terms of the uh, deliverables in terms of the schedule. So I would not really get into the details of what is a visual control. We all know what it is. But let me start off with the challenges. So one of the things uh, that we see from a challenge perspective was uh, student syndrome. So can anybody take a shot at you know what is uh, student syndrome? Right. So uh, we have all been uh, students in the past. And even if we had three weeks of a study holiday, probably we would study things only probably in the last few days. So there is a tendency to procrastinate or postpone things. Uh, which we know takes lesser time to complete than what is actually given. So when we make the workflow visual or you know, when we get into a visual mode, probably we, uh, you know, there is a Hawthorne effect that you know, comes into play. And when, when the work starts getting noticed, you, know, you start uh, you know, uh, uh, seeing signs of uh, student uh, syndrome getting eliminated. So it's only the delays that get passed. The early finish never gets passed. So that is, that is you know, one of the standard you know, project management uh, uh, practices that you know project management uh, practices that we'd have seen and uh, the other thing is uh, from a work prioritization perspective looking at workload leveling and also looking at uh, you know how uh, you know we will try to reduce the work in progress per person we wanted to make the workflow visual so the benefit of uh, you know doing a visual control is you know what uh, uh, what hits the high also hits the mind so it creates better collaboration between the teams. Uh, you know, it's one of the significant benefits. It also creates a ownership uh, by, uh, because I know that I am accountable for moving the task, you know, which is on the board, and I cannot afford to show the same status every day. And there is a transparency in terms of who gets allotted what, 
uh, that is the other benefit. And the other important thing is, you know, the visual, when you visualize the workflow, there is all, you also need to focus on the handoffs. See, uh, handoffs are the main reasons for delay when we look at uh, software development. And handoffs that is happening across teams is either something that we would want to eliminate or we would want to optimize, you know, from the uh, perspective of work. So the thing that we did here was we visualized the workflow by uh, putting in the various uh, faces in the form of uh, swim lanes. So we had a definition of done. We had daily uh, team huddles. And since this was a distributed team, we followed something similar to a scrum of scrums. So we had a, a single point of contact uh, who was there at each of the locations who would have this uh, status synchronized with the rest of the teams across the globe. And we also had these process and workflow diagrams which were pasted on the desks of the individuals so that it can add more as you know read and do kind of a thing so that people don't miss uh, you know what they need to be doing so we have already talked about the benefits in terms of ownership transparency getting a real time status and of course uh, there is also reduced management effort in terms of uh, collating the status and also checking with people on how they are doing i'm sorry about the diagram anyway it's not clearly visible what we have done here but these are just a couple of artifacts you know which i have shared from the project So I have just put in, uh, you know, three uh, diagrams here. Maybe Arian 5, Mars, Climate Orbiter, and uh, Gripen. So can anybody tell me what is the connect between these three things? So if you, <coughs> if you look back, uh, you know, uh, maybe if you Google it up and look back, so all these three are examples of simple software bugs which had extreme consequences. So if you look at Arian 5, uh, Arian 5 reused uh, code from Arian 4, and uh, this led to the uh, destruction of the satellite, self-destruction of the satellite as soon as it uh, got launched. And Mars uh, Climate Orbiter is one more example of, uh, uh, you know, usage of English metric system instead of a different metric system. So in all, in this case also code was uh, reused. And in uh, Gripen, which is more of a, a fighter plane, you know, as you can see, there was a particular exception which was not handled in the flight control system, which actually uh, led to the uh, explosion of the aircraft in certain scenarios. So, so the key uh, message that I wanted to you know pass is uh, reusing software modules does not guarantee safety to the system in which they are transferred. So this is one thing that we need to take uh, uh, into account when we start looking at projects uh, which are really having a huge uh, legacy code base. The other thing is there are, you know, certain things like flight control uh, software or medical equipments where even a Six Sigma-like quality will not be enough. So we probably need to go in for a zero defects kind of a thing. And the last thing, you know, just a point to ponder is uh, bugs do cost a lot. So they costed 0.6% of the gross domestic product of the United States a couple of years back. This is data a couple of years back. And uh, the other data that I wanted to just project is uh, rework is about 60 to 80 percent of the cost of software development. And uh, in this particular project also, we wanted to focus on rework. And I would like to define rework as a cost of poor quality. So how do we bring in the cost of poor quality down is one of the things that we focused on. And the things that we did, uh, see, we had a problem solving workshop where we looked at, uh, you know, the past data in terms of what were the defects that uh, had come in the previous releases. So we did a Pareto, and we did a root cause analysis based on the Pareto. And the other tool that we used was uh, FMEA, which is failure mode and elements, uh, failure mode and effects analysis. So we took the entire process end to end. We started looking at uh, what are the different ways by which this process can fail. And do I have the capability to detect uh, the failure in the process? And do I have a mechanism to address the impact that would come because of this failure? So it was more of a structured approach. Uh, so the uh, different things that we did, one was from a standardization perspective, in terms of coming out with, uh, see again here I would like to draw a line between uh, expertise and uh, standardization. So standardization can be used predominantly for the repetitive activities that we do, and can be done in the form of maybe templates or checklists or uh, automation. To just give an example, here uh, we focus on the low hanging fruits from a automation perspective. So uh, one of the things that we did was to look at the build, automate the build, which was the first thing uh, that we did. We also found that you know, there were lots of differences between the unit test and the integration test environments. So we had some uh, simulators 
which we developed, which would simulate some messages during unit testing so that I can detect those defects early. And we also looked at some uh, pre-filled uh, design templates. And we also had uh, uh, gating checklists, which were there at the end of the unit testing phase and the integration testing phase, as well as the user acceptance testing phase, just to do a check in terms of whether we have done all the things that we need to do. So we also had a special focus on the code quality. From a code quality perspective, uh, we saw that unit test coverage is one of the things that impacts uh, you know, the code quality. So we had a norm in terms of what the unit test coverage should be, and it became a part of, you know, uh, part of the gating criteria checklist. And the other thing is uh, we did competency management. So we started looking at uh, design structure matrix for uh, handling the dependencies better. And uh, we, uh, we also had some uh, feedback points, both from, the, uh, you know, uh, both from the customer as well as from the team at the end of the design phase and the unit testing phase. And we also had certain user acceptance tests, uh, you know, which were done as part of the uh, integration testing so that we can get early feedback in terms of how the code is behaving. So the uh, benefit was we, had, we were able to reduce the rework significantly. We completed system testing one week ahead of schedule. We had zero critical and high defects. And we were able to uh, you know, uh, reduce the defect by 69% from the uh, previous uh, similar releases in the past. And uh, last but not the least, uh, expertise was used to uh, validate the uh, code reuse and also for building the competency of the team wherever we found that you know, there were uh, significant gaps. And uh, the experts also played a role in doing reviews for certain things like uh, exception handling. So from a code quality perspective, we also followed a tooling approach. So uh, we, were, uh, using, we started using tools like JUnit and JStyle uh, to automate things. And also we had a memory profiling of the code, you know, which was done through the standard uh, memory profiling tools. So implementation productivity improved by 33%. And uh, the other thing is, you know, the prevention cost. Uh, this is a pyramid which gives you the prevention cost, uh, correction cost, and failure cost. So the failure cost can be maybe 100 times more than the prevention cost. So it's better to focus on prevention rather than allowing the failure to happen. So I'll talk a little bit about the design structure matrix. So design structure matrix is a visual representation of the forward and re reverse dependencies between the various elements of a system. So these elements could be features, they could be modules, they could be user cases, or they could be story points. And uh, the way we mark these dependencies is we either put a zero or a one to indicate the relative strength of the dependencies. And let me just show you an example. Uh, so there are three types of uh, relationships that we can model using a design structure matrix. So when we do uh, a parallel dependency, we don't you know, have any marks to indicate the dependency. When it's sequential, let's in this case, B depends on A. So you, uh, you have a X mark, you know, to indicate that B depends on A. And where we have, uh, you know, dependencies between A and B, we have just uh, put an X mark against each of that. So the key thing that we need to note here is uh, we will only be indicating the uh, relative dependencies in the design structure matrix and not the transitive dependencies. So let me just take an example. So if A depends on B and B depends on C, I would only be capturing the dependency between A and B and B and C, and not between A and C. So that is, that is what it is all about. And there is a site you know, which you can go to to look at uh, you know, the DSM, standard DSM macro. So this, uh, this is uh, right now uh, controlled by uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And uh, there are also certain other tools, you know, which if you want to do DSM from a code perspective also it is possible. So there are both commercial as well as non-commercial tools which are available. So here is a, you know, just a sample DSM that you can see with seven elements and 11 dependencies. So here A depends on B and F, and we have B depending on D, and so on it goes. So the usefulness of this is, uh, one thing is, you know, you, you, it helps you to manage the dependencies in a better way. So let's assume that you get a change request, and you want to look at uh, a module A, uh, you, know, uh, you know, which gets changed. Maybe if you want to look at what are all the other modules which are getting impacted because of change to A. You can uh, know at a glance, you know, how uh, these things are getting impacted. And it will also, DSM also, output also tells you what are the different levels at which you need to develop the modules. So for modules at the same level, I would rather do concurrent development and not a sequential development so that I can compress the timelines. And the other thing is it also gives you something called as a value thread. So value threads are again paths right from the start to the finish. So here the value thread is indicated uh, in uh, red color. So I can, uh, maybe when I'm you know, trying to 
a plan for a particular iteration or a sprint, I can probably look at completing one of these value threads. So that's how I can do the planning. So the uh, other thing is, you know, it can be also used as an input for reviews and it can help you to improve your upstream quality. And uh, there is also a complexity factor which comes out of the DSM, which can be used for the work allocation. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you allocate the work as per the comp uh, you know, uh, complexity, uh, you're probably preventing overburden or slack either way. So it's an optimal work allocation. And uh, for the uh, planning decisions, I think we should focus on three Cs, basically the complexity, the criticality, and the customer value. And that's what we did here. So this is just a rehash of whatever we have already spoken. So let me skip this in the interest of time. So the other thing that we did is uh, orthogonal arrays. So orthogonal arrays is more of a system modeling. So we all know that you know anything can be modeled as a system with an input as well as an output. So in orthogonal array, the inputs are uh, known as factors. And uh, the values which each of these factors can take are known as levels. And based on these factors and levels, uh, you know, I'm just giving you some examples here which you can look at, you know, from the insurance domain as well as the banking domain. You'll be able to generate a set of combinations uh, or you know, multiple rows. And each of these rows or combinations would be a test case in itself. And there are multiple ways to optimize. So I'm not getting into the details of that here. But you could use uh, equivalence class partitioning or boundary value analysis to look at what are all the levels which each factor can take. Simple example would be that if you're going for a flight reservation system, you have three uh, levels, right? You have zero to two, two to eight, and greater than eight. So these are the three different uh, levels that age can take you know, from a flight reservation system perspective. So I'm not getting uh, into the details of orthogonal arrays. Rather, I'll just focus on the benefits. So we were able to reduce test cases by 64% without impact to quality. And the regression test execution effort also reduced by 50%. In fact, if you're interested more on orthogonal arrays, I would point you to an article in I6 Sigma, which has been uh, written by uh, uh, Fadke. So there's a similar experience that he has reported from running uh, uh, you know, orthogonal, uh, orthogonal arrays on a regression test suite. So more or less, you know, we are seeing similar kind of data here. And uh, where do I do orthogonal arrays? Uh, you know, uh, this is a decision quadrant you know, that we wanted to use, that we used for the uh, project. So wherever we have the risk impact, you know, uh, the risk impact is less. So possibly there are certain modules, you know, where the risk impact is less uh, from the perspective of this particular release. And uh, uh, you know, those are the cases where we will use orthogonal arrays. And wherever we have a high risk impact uh, and also uh, you know, uh, the things are, you know, more stable. Maybe we would want to use orthogonal arrays more as a design approach to look at what are all the possible combinations of test cases, uh, you know, that we would want to design. So this is, in a nutshell, you know, what was achieved with respect to this particular project. So there was a 10% effort underrun. So we ended up with uh, spending 10% uh, less effort than what was planned. We were able to absorb 9% uh, additional effort, which means 19% is the effective gain that we had. And we delivered the product one week uh, before schedule, we had zero critical and high defects, and the defect density also reduced by 69%. We had a bonus payment from the customer because this was a risk reward model, and uh, last but not the least, the uh, productivity increased by 33%, which could, you know also gets reflected in all these numbers, whatever we are looking at. So just to uh, summarize, uh, I think you know from an execution excellence perspective, I think one should be looking at maximizing the flow and the value. So removing the impediments to flow and the uh, you know, non-value adds. Visualizing the workflow is a powerful technique which brings in greater collaboration, ownership, and transparency across the team. Uh, we should also be looking for early feedback points. And managing three Cs is uh, criticality, complexity, and customer value, which we already talked about. And whether you win or lose, don't lose the lessons learned. So modify the lessons learned. Standardize all the repetitive tasks, simplify and streamline. And uh, making the tacit knowledge explicit, uh, see, uh, basically what we have done here is both for the OA as well as for the DSM, we had a workshop where the entire team was involved. So that way the experts' knowledge gets shared across the team and we were able to make many, most of the tacit knowledge explicit. So that's probably one way to do it. The other way to do it is also to look at, you know, standardized repetitive activities where you can create something like a standard uh, operating procedure and also Alignment between the teams can be created you know, when you're using a DSM you know, kind of an approach. All the teams talk the same language and they are uh, aligned from the perspective of the value threads. 
So I just want you to leave uh, uh, with this one uh, closing thought. So there is a book by Atul Gawande, The Checklist Manifesto, Getting Things Right. So he has uh, done a lot of uh, research in terms of how these uh, high complexity industries work. And one thing he found in common, surprisingly, was the use of checklists. And uh, you know, this is what the New York Times has to say about this. Something as primitive as writing down a to-do list to get the stupid stuff right can make a profound difference. And what he says here is there are two types of checklists, read, do, and do confirm. So read, do is more of a recipe kind of a thing where uh, you know things are listed down and you do it. And the other thing is you do and you probably put a check mark and say that you know you just confirm that it has been done. And he also recommends not to have more than eight to 10 items in a checklist. And this is what is found to be most effective. So having a to-do list at the end of the day makes a lot of difference. So I'm open for uh, questions. Okay.